the book The Celestine Prophecy has been on the best seller, seller list of the New York Times. There is even a follow-up book called An Experiential Guide to help you understand. We are joined tonight by the author of that book, Carol Adrian. She worked with James Redfield, who was the author of The Celestine Prophecy, as this phenomenon continues to roll across North America. It is quite stunning. Yeah. This book that he wrote, The Celestine Prophecy, when you read it, what was the message to you? What was the message to me? Well, the, me the book is, a, is really kind of a spiritual thriller, right. and it takes the reader on a journey with a man who's never given a name to Peru, and they're lo he's looking for these insights from an ancient manuscript, which is detailing the evolution of our consciousness, in short. So, so this book was written as a fiction, because I think a lot of mm -hmm. people, you see, think that somehow right. in Peru there is this manuscript this manuscript with all the answers to life right what was what was Redfield's thinking about this His thinking in the beginning I think was to make it sort of a dry text he said he was just gonna write it out but I don't think anybody would have read it that way so right. he was brilliant and then he put it into the form of an adventure tale so everybody got caught up in not being able to put it down because each insight leads you on to want to know what the next one is and then he put it on the, in the back of his car and tried to sell right. it because no publisher would publish it or sell well, it. Well, he, he did self-publish it and he started giving it away. And so I really love the idea that he had such faith in it that he just started giving it away and saw what happened. And it just became a phenomenon. So what did you, what, what was the, the message, the insight for you that turned you? You then picked up the phone and said, we've got to do this. We've got to work together. Well, I was reading it. I was already doing work with people around life purpose and doing readings with people, consultations. So I knew that that was some of the most important questions we have today is what am I here to do on earth? Mm -hmm. And what's my life purpose? I love the part in the book about the coincidences are happening for a reason, that there are no accidents in the universe, that everything happens for a reason. And the reason is to help us fulfill our destiny or our purpose in life. All right, well, let's back up and sort of figure out what this means. Uh, there are nine insights that he talks about in the book. We, we can't go through them all, but, but the, the message is, really, is, as I think you've summed it up, there is no such thing as a coincidence. Everything right. that happens, happens for a reason. The problem is sometimes we just don't, know what the reason is or right and so we, we get stuck in our own juice you might say we have we have ways of dealing with the world that are sort of habituated and in the book we call those control dramas if you remember we get mm -hmm. stuck in a perhaps being an intimidator which is the unabomber syndrome I mean right. he's the ultimate intimidator isn't he and so it we break it down in these different ways that people sometimes I think a very common way is we stand aloof from life and we don't take that extra step to probe something to ask because when you interact with somebody if you have a question on your mind or you're wondering about something chances are that person might have a message for you might have something of, of note for you but if you just sit there and are aloof or distant or cold or don't come out then you're going to miss the messages that are meant for you this uh, we've talked about this as a phenomenon and I would be sitting on airplanes and I'd be watching business people right. devouring this book. I walked into a restaurant one night. The owner of the restaurant came over and said, you know, this yes. book has changed my life. Are people so hungry and desperate for some kind of, I don't know, do you call it religion? Do you call no. it spirituality? No, what is it? it isn't a religion because there's nothing organized about it. There, and in fact, the whole point of the book is talking about that we are spiritual beings. And the conversation that you just had with the two men before me shows how deeply in need of a spiritual direction we are and that that is a, at a base a trend that's happening more and more as we face lives that are not that fulfilling Pamela. but but in some senses is this not just like common sense like get more in touch with yourself uh, back in the 60s everybody used to talk about oh I get good vibes off that guy or that yes. gal I mean absolutely and I think that's an excellent point I tell the people in my classes not to make this into a, some complex philosophy. It's a simple way. Actually, the principles are known by most people. I think the phenomenon of this book happened because the timing is right right now. We are looking for something else, and the something else is in here. No authority outside of us is going to tell us what's right, what's wrong. No church is going to fulfill that. Although you can, it, we, there's no reason you can't, you know, continue to be in, in any church of your. But, but do you know what some of the critics have said, you know, the description that this is sort of fast food spirituality. If you go into a bookstore, there's 50 different books mm -hmm. saying, get in touch with yourself, uh, right. you know, be more uh, sensitive to others. You mm -hmm. know, some of these common mm -hmm. truths. What's different? 
what is different? That's a really good question. Why did this little green book have such an impact? Again, I think he was a genius and then he made it a very simple story. People could follow it along. Mm -hmm. And people recognize the truth of it within themselves, Pamela. Every time I have a class or a workshop, I ask people, I said, how many of you feel like you already knew these truths in the book? And everybody raises their hand. So it's not like they're getting right. news. It's not a news story, but it's a recognition. It's almost like people are being awakened at this point and activated. That's, I know that may sound a little strange, but that's what I'm feeling when I talk with people. There is such an excitement when people come to study it or when they talk about it and they talk about when they found the book and what happened in their lives and how their lives have changed since then. There's a real sizzle to it. How are we supposed to, inter I mean, when you talk about there's no such thing as a coincidence or synchronicity, I think, is a phrase that keeps coming up. I mean, how far do we take this? You know, that you're here tonight has more to do with logistics than anything else in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there any greater meaning to our encounter? I think it's very interesting looking at the coincidence of the two men that were on before and your subject before about terrorism and technology and the controversy about whether technology is good or bad, is it evil or purposeful or whatever. That's exactly the same stuff we're talking about in the Celestine Prophecy. We're talking about those issues and people have questions about those issues. People have real questions. And when you look at somebody like the Unabomber, he is an expression of, you might say, the collective shadow, our collective dissatisfaction with a lot of our lives. And I'm not saying, and I don't think James Redfield is saying that all of industry is bad, because technology can serve us. But if we let it be the overriding, uh, I don't even know what to say, force. force in our lives, and we serve it, then we've lost our humanity and our spiritual base. All right. Carol Adrian is our guest. The topic is the Celestine Prophecy, and our phone number is 1-800-481-NEWS. That's 1-800-481-6397. Give us a call. We'll be back in just a moment. It just hit the bookstand, became an absolute phenomenon right across the world, not just North America. The idea, uh, Carol, as we've been talking about it, this notion of coincidences and that we are here for a purpose and we just have to recognize it. For the, for the three remaining people in the world who haven't read the book, um, actually I think there's probably more than that, what are we talking about when we say insights, the nine insights that are talked about in right. this book? It's, it's, there are nine principles that he details out as to how he sees the evolution of consciousness happening. So he's reminding us that we are here for a purpose, we are, spiritual, we are a spiritual being, we're on earth to learn something. And our journey on earth is to find out who we are and to, to find, you know, develop that and bring that out and contribute to the planet. One, one of my interpretations of the book, and I don't know whether I'm right or not, but it was almost like there are people who are destined to be together because there is a bit of a love story in mm -hmm. the Celestine Prophecy as well. I, is that what you think? I mean, I there's, think there's yeah. a Jack for every Jill out there. Well, I don't know if it's that balanced, <laughs> but I do think that we come into life sometimes to work through things with certain people, and we, we have certain affinities in uh, our values, and we s tend to find those people, and sometimes they show up coincidentally. What about the energy thing? Because this harkens back to something yes. we said uh, a few moments ago. Sort of, we used to talk in the '60s about good vibes. So I got right. good vibes from mm -hmm. that guy. And and in the book, you talk about the energy, energy. level and mm -hmm. being able to relate to that. And in fact, relationships is, are about sort of exchanges of energy. Right. Oh, this is such a great topic. It is so big because you were right. In the early '60s, we were talking about good vibrations. Well, that's one way of seeing energy. You can feel energy in the book, in the Celestine book. We're talking about being able to see the energy around a person emanating off of them. Physically see Physically. It? And I have people in my classes who can do that, or who see it. And so it, people, there are people who can use, you know, have that ability. It's not so important to see it as, as to realize that we are all within this energy. And see, this concept comes from quantum physics, which says now, it's, the whole idea of the book is talking about a shift of consciousness, a shift in the way we see the world. So we're not seeing the world in the old way. The old world view was very mechanistic. This is more holistic. It's all right, all let's, part of the energy. Let's take a call from Toronto, from Jerry. Go ahead. Hi. I've read the book, um, and I think it's a lot of malarkey. <laughs> I think if you're simple-minded, yeah, you're going to understand the book, but I'm not a simple-minded person. Okay, I'm a pastor of a church, mm -hmm. and I feel that we have to turn to the Ten Commandments of God. This is what we talk about in churches, this, that circular-type system life. Is we have to remove ourselves from the circularism 
of life. And this is what's happening to these but, people. But that Terry, read this you're, you're a pastor in a church. I mean, are, are you just feeling a little threatened by, <laughs> by this pro the prophecy, the proposal, and the, its popularity that somehow people might choose this instead of organized religion? Well, you know, if you're going to read Superman, it's good because you get a kick out of it, you know. I feel that uh, this is n not doing anything for me whatsoever. And of all the people that I've run into, it's it's a mixture of technology. You know, we're, mm -hmm. we're going too fast here. Everybody says the world is really moving fast and it's changing. It's for the best. And I say, no, we're going in the wrong direction. All right, well, let's hear from Carol on this because you know there are a lot of critics out there to say, you know, this is, I mean, this was great marketing. Basically, that's what this is about. This is stuff that everybody would know, but they're too busy, in fact, to live their lives this way. And, and if you have time to sit around and meditate and, and go off to Peru to, uh, uh, you know, discover yourself, we'd all be feeling better, but that's not the reality of life. Well, I, it sounds as though this doesn't resonate with Jerry on the phone. And that's all right. This book isn't about proselytizing anybody to follow it. You, ha the, you will know the truth of it as you begin to grow and understand and see it, the truth of it in your own life. And, you know, we totally recommend that people stay with the church they have if that's working for them. There's no reason to leave anything. And if this is, reading the book is uh, kind of taking up too much time, then don't read it. But is it counter-religious, do you think? No, not at all. It's talking about, it, it, there, it may be counter-religious in the sense that there are those who believe that the, uh, the only way to have a relationship with spirit is to have it on the external and to find that uh, connection on the external. This book is talking about looking within for your own spiritual intuition and growth within. So there is a, there is a difference of opinion here and it may not work for some people. But some of the concepts you describe, and we were talking just before Jerry called about sort of energy fields and people actually being able to recognize that in other people. And another notion that you really support is the, the whole question of telepathy, that people in fact are aware of other things. And, and I mean, these are the kinds of things that make religious people uh, very, very uh, skeptical. Well, because they, they're probably not looking at the unified field of energy where we're all connected at that level. So telepathy is not anything mystical other than it's the natural law of being connected at the cellular level. So it's another way of looking at spirituality. And there are some people who are not going to go for it. It's all right, their path. We'll go to Brampton and take a call from Lisa. Go ahead. Um, yes, I'd like to make a comment, and I have a question. Okay. My comment is, um, I was brought up Catholic, and this book has brought me closer to um, a higher entity I call God than anything has ever touched me before, and it's, it backs up religion. Okay, and, and what's your question for Carol? Um, where did the ideas for the insights come from? If there wasn't any manuscripts, where did they come from? Well, that's a good question. I mean, did he just invent this in his head, Mr. Redfield? Well, I can't speak for him. <laughs> I don't know the exact process he went through to come up with this, but whatever it was, it was a very, I think, very enlightened way of showing these universal truths, which have been talked about by so many authors for a long time. This is not news, but he had the sense of putting it together in a way that leads you from one thought to the next, and it seems to follow. You read the book, mm -hmm. and then you somehow got in touch with James Redfield, which isn't easy because he lives right. quite reclusively, actually. Uh, and then the two of you did this book, mm -hmm. an experiential guide. So what does this book do? Well, it, to me, the book, uh, the novel was wonderful. And I started, like everybody else did, going through and yellow lining it. And I started making up exercises for my own clients in my own classes. And that's kind of where my interest grows. I, I like to make things applicable to my life. And this is not a book, this is not an intellectual head trip. This is a book about getting in touch with your own life and looking to see what is coming into you. What is your intuition telling you about what you need to do in your life? If you're feeling restless or frustrated, that has a, a message for you. So to touch in with that. And life is not always rosy being on the spiritual path. And the obstacles and the setbacks and disappointments that we have are still the way that we learn and grow and that you will get answers for questions you have when you concentrate your energy and ask for that and trust that it will come in. So it's a very spiritual path of getting the answers that you need. So the book is meant for people to experience the insights for themselves and in also a more practical in a practical way, individually or in groups. And there are, there are thousands of groups all over the country. All right. We'll be back in just a moment with Carol Adrian and the Celestine Prophecy. Our Tonight, the Celestine Prophecy, bestseller on the New York uh, bestseller list for 82 weeks. Carol, what is 
the Celestine prophecy, not the book, the prophecy. The prophecy has to do with the evolution of consciousness and where would we go if we were all thinking in a more enlightened way and living our lives more uh, inspired by our own uh, intuition. So the prophecy says that if we begin keep doing this, more and more of us are going to feel this way and the consciousness will grow exponentially. And so once that happens, it will create a major shift in the way that we see the world and we will live our lives in a different way. All right, to Scarborough and a call or question from Jim. Go ahead. Yes, hi. I'm uh, in the middle of the book, actually. I've had it for several months, and I had to stop reading it because quite, uh, quite uh, seriously I was frightened by it. What do you mean? Well, um, I found just by what uh, was just said now, the idea of enlightenment and uh, finding yourself. I'm a recovering alcoholic, and I've basically, uh, in reading the book, uh, it was coincided with my recovery, and it really frightened me. I wondered if she had any feedback. Uh, from other people on that. I uh, know I haven't had. What is it particularly that frightens you? Okay, I think we've uh, we've lost the call there. I, I'm not sure of that concept, but I guess what he's saying that if if you know the whole world is going to change if everybody subscribes to this. I mean, there is that sense. The the very the the ninth insight, as I recall mm -hmm. it, is uh, is a description, and we know this is fiction, but that the Mayan people were so in touch with energy and so. Uh, connected to one another that they simply vibrated themselves into oblivion. They, they well, disappeared, they're on a higher plane. I think you can take that, par uh, that idea a little bit too far here. We're not talking about the Mayans specifically. That was meant as a metaphor to show right. that where people can go. There's some really great literature out right now. Do you know Michael Murphy who founded the Esalen Institute, mm -hmm. wrote The Future of the Body and his new book is called In the Zone. Both those books really um, give great research examples on how we have as humans these metanormal capacities. And if, the, if we grow, you see, we are used to looking at evolution in terms of our form changing. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the evolution of our consciousness and where that leads. And it's a very gentle process within us. We're not going to go any faster than we need to. So I don't think, you know, I, I can understand that someone might have mentioned that he had a fear around this, mm -hmm. but I would recommend that you stop reading it then and look at the fear and, and get in touch with what is that fear based in. In, in some ways, it, you know, and uh, the critics again have said this, it's so simplistic in terms of, you know, narrowing down these human interactions to kind of four different kind of people, you know, mm -hmm. the interrogators right. or the me-tooers or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, that somehow life isn't that simple, that we're, mm -hmm. as human beings, much more complex than that. There are a lot of Absolutely. things. Absolutely. And these are meant as simple uh, expressions so that you can begin to notice and become aware of these interactions. Because we have these power struggles. As I mentioned, the Unabomber really stands for the intimidator model in a big picture way. You know, we, on lesser scale, will, will encounter people like this. But if you really look at it, there are, everybody will react in some way to these four different energy patterns. And they are simplified, but they give us a handle on making it something we can understand without having to go and get a PhD in psychology. All right, let's go to Calgary and take a call from Stella. Go ahead, Stella. I just want to ask uh, your guest, uh, is she familiar with Buddhism? Because when I read the book, I find a lot of things that they were saying were very close to, you know, what Buddhism was saying. All right, about that's... About coexistence and things like that. Is this just a kind of a modern version of Buddhism? No, not at all. But there is a, a, an attempt here to blend Eastern and Western thought, which is a very valuable thing to do because you'll get the truth of both sides coming in. So there is a lot of Buddhist thought here. There's a lot of different sources coming in. And there's wisdom coming from many paths. And the Celestine prophecy doesn't claim to have any sort of... Uh, you know, mark on the on wisdom. We ha we're offering sort of a potpourri of ideas mm -hmm. with the, the general theme that we are evolving, whether we know it or not. I guess uh, I'm always a little skeptical on these things when I look around at friends and family and how hard people have to work just to keep their heads above water these days, mm -hmm. uh, just meeting the bills, just keeping the roof mm -hmm. over their heads. That there's not a lot of time in in the day. Mm -hmm. for people to sit back and say, uh, I'm just going to be meditative or contemplative at this point. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not going to hurry. I'm going to stop and feel that connection that there might be between me and some other individual. Mm -hmm. There's not, a lot of people don't have those options. Well, and that's their choice. But the people that I'm dealing with who read the book, I can't tell you how many people are responding to this now for what reason that's the they are finding some truth in it they're finding that it does work and for the people who are in that pattern of work 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 mm -hmm. you know if they stopped and began to use a little bit more slowing down tuning in a little bit more they would find their their life opened up 
easier. James Redfield is off as we speak, writing the tenth insight. Mm -hmm. Which uh, do you know what it is? No. Um, do you have any idea? <laughs> no, not really. I mean, where's where do you think he'll go? You understand this? I mean, what what do you think his message is at this point? I for think people? he's concerned about the conflict between people and and terrorism and those ideas. I think he's very concerned about that. And uh, I don't know what the absolute, you know, subject matter of this right. next insight is. I'm as, as curious as anybody else. You are here, uh, courtesy of the Learning Annex, which is kind of a forum for exchange of ideas. You do this for a living. Um, yes, I'm giving a workshop there on Saturday here and, in Toronto. And, and this is what you're doing. I mean, people are really responding, oh, lining yes. up. I've been on a tour all over the country, and this is not something I'm promoting. I'm being asked to come and lead these groups. And I just love meeting the people that are coming in because they're very conscious, very... Uh, integrity people and they are working very hard on these issues to apply them in their own lives. Incredible phenomenon. Thanks very much to Carol Adrian tonight, our discussion about the Celestine prophecy. Tomorrow night, learning disabilities, dyslexia, all of those problems, it may all be related to the inner ear. So give us a call tomorrow night. We'll see you then.